got an amazing show lined up for you guys today. I am welcoming Brett Eichenberger to the show, who is one of the creative minds behind the Flash of Beauty series. Uh, their first film, Bigfoot Revealed, was an absolutely beautiful uh, testament to witnesses and their encounters with Sasquatch. everybody and welcome to the paranormal portal i'm your host brent thomas thank you so much for joining us today we've got an epic show ahead but just remember if any of you have experiences you'd like to share i'd love to hear from you you can either email me at paranormalportalradio at gmail.com or head over to paranormalportal.net scroll down and find the button that says interview me and that'll allow you to look at a calendar of possible times and dates and uh, find a date that works for you Love to hear your stories, so definitely get in touch with me. And now their newest film, The Flash of Beauty, Paranormal Bigfoot is out, and I I haven't quite had the chance to see it yet, but I'm really excited to check it out because I know the quality of the work these guys do is just second to none. Their beautiful cinematography, excellent uh, the excellent interviews and uh, amazing guests. So, uh, without further ado, let's welcome him to the show. Hey, Brett. W- sorry. Hey, Brett. Welcome to the show. I got to tell you, I always I've been called Brett my whole life, and I'm always like, no, it's Brent. Brett. And now I got a Brett here, and I'm calling you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's so funny. I the same thing happens to me too, all the time. It's either Brent, Brad, yeah. Greg. <laughs> I, I don't yeah. know why I'm always called Greg. Yeah, well, Greg, I've never, I've never got that one. But uh, thanks so much for being here, brother. I really appreciate taking the time and making this happen. And I, I guess probably the curious thing for me is always where did people come from to get to their journey? And so for you, how did how did you end up doing this? Um, you know, I hardly remember a time I wasn't doing this. Okay. My uh, my father was like. You know, in the in the mid seventies, early eighties, was into like gadgets and stuff, and so we always had like the first video camera and whatnot. Uh-huh. And so, there's I, there's never been a time in my life where I don't think I was around a camera. Uh-huh. And um, he eventually, my dad eventually got into like infomercials and like you know like those late night commercials and stuff. <laughs> yeah. And so he, quite honestly, you know, rest in peace, dad. But quite honestly, he was too cheap to. Uh, to hire a camera guy. So he figured, you know, like when I hit 12, 13 years old, he would just have me be his camera guy. So we'd go out, you know, and, and I'd film things for him and stuff. And he'd do these like stand up on camera things. And anyways, the bug bit me very early and I, I learned so much from my dad. I learned how to Mm -hmm. edit. I learned how to shoot, um, audio sound, all that other kind of stuff. And my dad was kind of self-taught. And so, you know, with, my friends in early age, we just started making movies and short films and screwing around and mm-hmm. experimenting. And I would have loved to have had an iPhone when I was a kid with a camera, but instead we were, you know, hauling around these huge <laughs> like video camcorders with like, you'd have to carry the tape deck with you and it'd be attached to the <laughs> form of wow. dating yourself. So, no, that's, yeah. I, I, you know, yeah. I think we're in about the same, the same area there for uh, the technologies and stuff. Thank God for micro miniaturization. That's all I gotta say. Oh man, I'm telling you. Yeah. I'm telling so you. where did where did your where did the Bigfoot come into this picture? Was this a a fascination of your of your life as well, or was there any moment that was like, God, I want to look into this. I want to start exploring this. Um, I mean, Bigfoot has been an interest of mine for as long as I can remember. I mean, going back to probably the first grade, you know. Oh, okay. Um. And growing, this is all part of growing up in Oregon. And I remember it was 1982. I went saw ET. I was like maybe five, six years old. And I was just like, I was just sitting there like eyes as big as saucers. Mm. And I couldn't get enough of this paranormal realm. And then, you know, quickly thereafter, I watched Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And of course, you know, Star Wars, everybody was into Star Wars then. Oh, yeah. Um, but it was this, this idea that science fiction could be real that captiv- captivated me very early on. And so I wanted to know anything and everything about it, you know, as a kid. And Bigfoot, you know, was kind of like the closest I could get aside from ghosts to the paranormal in my quote unquote neighborhood. 
Sure. And I grew up as a kid playing in the woods and stuff. And so it just kind of felt like um, close, I guess you could say. And so it's just, it's just really always been something. I'm like, you know, wondering my entire life if they're real or if they're not. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this has been a childhood dream in a lot of ways is to, to answer that question, which I've now answered. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Ha- have you had a, an encounter of your own? I've had um, near misses or quasi encounters. Okay. Um, we've had a bluff charge. Ooh. Um, I've gotten responses from wood knocks that I've done up the Owl Moon uh, wilderness. Um, I was doing a series of wood knocks, and uh, I mean we're out in the middle of nowhere. There's nobody around, mm-hmm. and I'm not getting anything. And finally, I did I did a loud one, and then I got I got one back that was unmistakable. I mean instantly hair. Stands up. Mm. I mean, it was, it sounded like Louisville Slugger hitting a Grand Slam. It was just, it was so, and it wasn't a gun or anything else. We're by ourselves. We're out in the middle of nowhere. It, I knew exactly what it was. Wow. And it, I mean, it was just, it wasn't like scary as much as it was thrilling, I guess. Sure. Sure. Um, so that's happened. And, uh, you know, I mean, we, we, Smelled some interesting things in the middle of the night in weird places. You know, the wet dog skunk kind of smell. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've seen eye shine. Oh, wow. Red eye shine. Um, and uh, that was really interesting. That was on a reservation out in Native Reservation in the Midwest. And there's a photo. I got a photo of it that is in um, the sequel. Oh, fantastic. So, that was cool, yeah. That is fantastic. Now, when you when you got that answer to that tree knock, I mean, that's when it that's kind of where the rubber hits the road for me. It's like you're out there looking, you're in this journey, and and suddenly you've created this this quasi dialogue with something that you can't possibly understand that we just don't know anything about. Is there an element of fear in that then too? It's like, oh, well, now they know we're here and they know where we are, and I mean, they could be coming. Doesn't that almost terrify you? To a certain extent, to a certain extent, because you know that, that they have power over you, yeah. um, and they're definitely, um, an apex predator. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you know, it, it brings me peace knowing that, you know, throughout this entire process of us doing the research, we've heard maybe one or two stories that were kind of passed down of people being attacked and sure. indoor hurt by Bigfoot. It's not very common. Um, and in the area that we were in, um, you know, these, these Sasquatches, these Bigfoots were gifting and, mm-hmm. and doing things out of curiosity and, and whatnot. And so they seemed, you know, for the most part, benevolent. You know, I didn't get a chance to have coffee with them, you know, to really <laughs> find out what's, what makes them tick. But sure. yeah, I mean, there's a scare, the, the unknown is scary. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of people out there, I think, that, um, have had their Bigfoot sightings that, that weren't believers before they had them, mm-hmm. you know, and it takes something that profound in order for them to completely have that paradigm shift. Yeah. So it, it's life changing. Yeah. Yeah, it, it really is. And that's one of the things that, that I find incredible about this because yeah, of course I think everybody knows somebody or has had discussions with people that have maybe seen a ghost or seen, seen UFOs or something. But, but this, this phenomena when people see it or, or witness it, it absolutely shatters paradigms. And like none other, um, lifelong hunters that have been a part of the, the wilderness has been a part of their lives through their entire journey. And suddenly they don't want to go in the woods anymore. And, and it's just this impo- this Im- impressive and profound impact that it has on their lives. It, it's, it's just incredible to me. Oh yeah, yeah, and that's that was part of the reason behind um, the the motivation behind the first film, Flash of Beauty, Bigfoot Revealed, was getting into the psyche of these people because I truly believe that you know these are eyewitnesses that are so credible mm-hmm. that you know had this had this been a court case, there would have been a conviction, you yeah. know, and I, I believe that about so many of these cases, especially the ones that we have in our new film. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, science is tough. Science is rigorous and science is essential and skepticism is essential. And I'm not going to say, I'm not going to poo-poo those things by any stretch of the imagination, but people need to be taken seriously. They're not hallucinating. Right. You know, there's there's t- tens of thousands of people that have had these sightings. 
They know what they saw. They know what a bear looks like. Um, many of these people are pillars of the society. Mm-hmm. You know, we have Rich Jermo is a police officer that's in our first film. And, and to me, that's substantial proof. And many of these people have post-traumatic stress disorder yeah. from their signings. And so that's why we interviewed Dr. Michael Adams is to really kind of get into the psyche of these people that are seeing these things. Mm-hmm. You know, it's easy for a skeptic to say, no, they don't exist because they don't, have, there's not a body. But when, when you, you're able to sit down and, listen to someone's story and look into their eyes and, and kind of feel that kind of quiver in their voice. Yeah. You, you mean to tell me that you're going to argue with this person and accuse them of seeing something else or making it up, especially people like Chad and Austin in our first film who had, you know, watched this thing for like a minute and a half. Wow. You know, this isn't a brown blurry fuzzball that goes dashing across the road. This is, they're watching a seven to eight foot, 10 foot being moving and walking and, you know, interacting with the forest. You know, this is something that they're observing carefully. And it it imprints in your brain. And, you know, we, we get into all the brain stuff in the movie too. But sure. I, I just, it, to me, it's a, I just think, like we just said before, it's just, it's just so, so profound. And I think people need to take into the, cre- the credibility of these eyewitnesses. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I know that a lot of times people dismiss that that witness testimony, but I agree. I think I think that the the sheer number and the sheer scope of witnesses that have had encounters, uh, and and most of them, if not uh, the the majority, were not out there looking for this. It it found them, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, you know. Yeah, it's, it's exactly right. That's exactly right. It's exactly right. Yeah, because you, you, when you think of like people out there looking, well, they're they're going to automatically, and and I find this for myself. I do some paranormal investigating as well. Is that, yeah, I certainly have to fight with myself not to jump to a to a confirmation bias. Like, well, that that moved has got to be a ghost. Well, no, no, it doesn't. Let's really dial into this, dig into it, look at all the factors present. But people that have these encounters that this wasn't even a part of their vocabulary prior to this, and suddenly it's it's changed their worldview. I mean, this is uh, very, very powerful stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And and so many people will never speak of it, ever. Yes. You know, until the day they die. You know, I mean, we we had a friend who was a scientist, passed away uh, first of October, but um, he had Defense Department contracts. He had NASA contracts. Um, he was very esteemed. He had a lot going on. And when we were doing our pre-interviews for Flashy Beauty, what we do is we talk to people on Zoom or what we're a phone call or whatever. Mm. Uh, we spoke with him and, you know, ultimately he decided not to share his story because of his connections and, and stuff. But he told us a story about, um, you know, he and his, his five brothers would go hunting, um, every year the day after Thanksgiving up in uh, the Alleghenies in Pennsylvania. And, um, 1983, I think it was, they went out hunting. And there's about six inches of snow or whatever. Um, and about, you know, gosh, maybe 10, 20 minutes into the forest, into the woods that they were familiar with that were in their backyard. Um, the older brother, you know, went like this, quiet, and everybody stopped. And these guys, these are all former vets. And they're carrying, like, pretty heavy artillery, more, way more what, than what they needed for hunting. Mm-hmm. And that was part of the fun of it for these guys. Sure. So he goes, stop, and and then um, he motioned for everybody to get around in a circle, and they couldn't figure out what was going on. And then not 30 seconds later, they see this gigantic 10-foot-tall Bigfoot coming towards them, carrying a dead bull elk underneath its right arm. Oh, my God. <laughs> and wow. this guy, this scientist who had his doctorate and everything, I mean, like I said, very steep, he leans forward and he looks at us and he goes, you don't want to see one. You don't want to see one. And as he says this, his voice cracks, his lip quivers. I'll never forget it as long as I live. Yeah. It was I mean, it was insane. He never told that story publicly. I suppose, and, and it, it, that is the the case because I, I think that's probably now more than ever 
this dialogue is more common than ever before, but I still think it's it's certainly got a ways to go um, in order for us to have sincere and open dialogue with, you know, the population at large, maybe. But I think it's also uh, uh, the mission and, and the scope of what you do is to put it out there, you know, and, and show people that this stuff is happening and, and the to to see the the sincerity of the witnesses for me was the most powerful part of it. It's just exactly like you say, you look into their eyes and you can see them relive in this moments in their, in their words and in their, in their gestures and, and, and the, the, the far away look in their eyes as they're transported back to that. And you know, this is not, this is not something just, uh, you know, for a five minutes of attention that some people yeah. do. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 why we do the interviews the way that we do them, where we have the individual look into the camera because I feel like the audience is able to get, connect. Yes, you know, the eyes are the windows to the soul, and and when you can connect with those people, you know, we've had people watch our films cry because of the the emotional connection that they establish. You know, yeah. Daryl Wilson is a great example of that, and and his story is so profound, and and what happened to him in Alaska is now becoming legendary because of of how profound it was you know um and he you know daryl daryl was was terminally ill you know he he had maybe only a couple of months if not less of life left in him yeah. and this this happened to him and and you know i don't know that it was it was because of the he had a new will to live and that helped the healing process or if there was something that happened between him and the bigfoot I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I'm open to either one. And I think there's a lot of evidence out there that these things can potentially heal folks. Yeah. Um, you know, but, uh, I don't know where I was going with that. I'm going off on a tangent, but anyways, the whole point is, is that I love doing this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's the whole point. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what you, you're doing, you're doing it amazingly well because, you know, and, and I, I have the benefit of having seen the Flash of Beauty Bigfoot revealed and, and it's powerful in so many ways. Cinematography, the, the fact that you bring people to the experience, to the eyes of the witness and to share their stories. Now, um, that in and of itself was just a, a beautiful, um, opus to this whole, this whole phenomena. But now you're, you're stepping back into it with the paranormal Bigfoot. And was that a hard thing? for you to do, because I, I think that for me personally, and not that this is about me, but I think I'm a microcosm in a sense of, of a lot of uh, the people in this and that I, I love the idea that this is out there. I, I have no doubt that it is, but it's, it's a whole nother step to say, not only is it out there, but here's the weird stuff. And, and that's where it's like, wow, what do I do with that? How do you process it for, for you? How did that journey go? Um, you know, it's what's really interesting, Brent, is just because the fact that we weren't in the Bigfoot community mm -hmm. for quite some time, I think it was a lot easier for us. Okay. We don't, you know, everybody's affected by ridicule and, and criticism and whatnot. But, you know, coming from the world of narrative feature films, uh, we've experienced that from, you know, the Los Angeles Times ripped apart my last feature film, you know, pretty broken. She didn't like it. The critic didn't like it. And it was, it was tough. And, you know, this is big media. Um, this is a world stage kind of a thing, if you will, when you put these movies out there. You read some of these reviews on Amazon, and you're like, whoa, many were glowing, many were not, you know. And it's like, so we knew that going into the Bigfoot community, we would experience some of this backlash. Mm -hmm. We knew it was a tough crowd to please. But the truth of the matter is, is that we're not going to skew the data. We're not going to pander to anybody other than the truth. You know, we want to fulfill the truth. And we knew... Very quickly that, you know, in the, in the production of the first film, we knew very quickly that we needed to do a, a paranormal film in and of itself. We wanted to give the, um, the, the flesh and blood world, a, um, the respect that it deserves because these things are quasi flesh and blood paranormal, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Um, and we couldn't fit it all into one documentary. So, um, we started, you know, collecting these different stories from the paranormal. And um, and then we kind of just went on this, like, we just kind of went down the rabbit hole. And we we were looking for stories. We found these stories, and people would come to us with stories. And uh, I, don't, I don't know how we got some of the stories that we got 
for the second one. Some of them are just, they still astound me to this day. It's just, it was just all by, you could say it was by chance coincidence, or you could say that it was, um, it was a path that had been preordained for us, you know? And, and I think there's a lot of, uh, hints that it could have been, um, you know, I think these things, I think these beings want their story told. They want to be out there. They, We've believed from the very, very beginning that they're not monsters. They don't want to hurt people. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not to say that there's some that do want to hurt people because there's humans that want to hurt people. Right. Um, you know, there's animals that want to hurt people. Um, but, you know, I think 99% of them are, are just good, ordinary beings that just want to live their life in privacy. Sure. In seclusion. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so yeah, I mean, it, it's... The paranormal is real. Uh, the you know the paranormal is a very weighted word. It really actually just means above normal. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of people out there that you know come from a religious background and say, well, how could you do a paranormal Bigfoot documentary? Because you know that gets into some weird stuff. And we're like, well, you know, there's you take a look at some of the miracles that have been performed, um, and you could equate that to the paranormal. Sure. So you know, it's I in in in. And that's what we've discovered is it's all part of the unseen realm. It's all part of, of an area that science hasn't quite figured out yet. Yeah. That's a tough, tough thing. Um, because again, it's not everybody's there, but so, you know, there's, there's definitely, and, and I guess having done a show where I speak to any number of witnesses and experiencers and stuff, there's, I, I know I can't discount it, but it is, it is hard. I mean, I have a personal paradigm as well. And while I keep an open mind and stuff, it is hard to understand. How does this work where it's a, a very, it seems like a very, I guess here's, here's where I get stuck on it and, and I don't know what to do with it. It seems like a very primitive, possibly, uh, well, at least they live very primitively, uh, from what we understand. They, they leave footprints, they consume, um, they interact very physically with the world around them. So they are physical they leave hairs and and scat and any number of things and then but they're also something else and and that's the hard part it's like well are these because some people postulate maybe they're extraordinarily advanced but they don't live extraordinarily advanced and everything else about them seems to be a very uh, primitive life form and yet somehow they have this potential control over particle physics and quantum physics and, you know, and, and dimensional realities or, or abilities. And, and that's where I get stuck. And, and that's the hard part for me, but what would you say to that? I guess it comes down to the definition of advanced. You know, I mean, we think of ourselves as, you know, these extremely intelligent beings, but how intelligent are we really? You know, we, we need, we have to have a shelter to survive. We have to have clothes to survive. We, you know, um, we need all of these different things, these different crutches in order to, to live. And, you know, at the, at our root, we're still spiritual beings. We're, you know, bodies are just meat bags that carry around our souls and our spirits. And, um, you know, I think, in my opinion, after after doing both of these films, I've learned that, you know, advancement is getting, getting you know, your spiritual awareness to a higher level so that you can be open to nature and you can, I mean, there's just all these things that we kind of seclude ourselves from that we don't really know that exist. Yeah. That do, you know, in other words, um, I mean, look at the way that, that the average American eats, you know, versus... You know, the way that the Bigfoot might eat, you know what I mean? They're, they're, they're living these pure lives. Mm-hmm. Um, as, you know, Mel Skahan says in the first film, they're, he believes they're, they're the purest form of human. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, there might be that type of intellectual advancement. It certainly seems that they're extremely smart. So, you know, that's a really loaded question. <laughs> sure. And and I don't, I, I, I apologize that that seemed unfair, but, you know. No, no, not at all. It's just the hard part, you know. How, how do we yeah. process this? Yeah. That's what I don't know. But I appreciate what you're saying. And, and you know, in light of that, I, I certainly cover 
a lot of topics in the scope of my show where, you know, there's there's all kinds of interdimensional oddness, strangeness, even, you know, in the form of uh, not only creatures and, and beings and, and intelligences, but even the world around us when you look at the, you know, like the Mandela effect and things like that, where it seems like we might have hopped into a different reality at some point, you know, because things are almost the same, but not quite. And, and it makes you go, well, something happened here, you know? So that's, that's the curiosity for me. But, um, it, I, I do commend you doing it because I think it's a discussion that needs to have, regardless of whether people are uh, comfortable with it or not. And certainly there are, there's definitely the two camps in the Bigfoot world that there's those that are like, yep, these are, these are something else. They're interdimensional, transdimensional beings or possibly extraterrestrial. And then there's the, you know, there's some kind of, hominid or primitive, you know, ape human type hybrid and and you get both worlds. So, but I don't think you can still just ignore half the picture. Would you agree? 100%. I absolutely 100% agree. I I think that anybody that's that's doing research in any field needs to have an open mind at each and every possibility. That's how discoveries are made, you know, and it happens all the time in science. You know, and at, and the same is absolutely true with Bigfoot. You know, if you've got Again, you know, it's it's one thing to have a few people say, well, I saw orbs at the same time I saw Bigfoot or I saw UFO or I saw Bigfoot cloak or whatever. But we don't. We have hundreds and hundreds of people that are saying this. Mm -hmm. And those are the people that are willing to talk. Right. You know, and and I believe that, you know, in our film, we have extremely compelling evidence to show that something is happening. And we have it on camera. You know, we have, we, we have a, a, a number of examples that either we caught on camera, um, you know, later on in the film, or we have Barb Shoup's famous example of the cloaked Bigfoot, yeah. which, you know, I'll talk about for just a second. We, we had Eric Bard, of course, from, uh, the Mystery of Skinwalker Ranch, um, take a look at the video and he was dumbfounded. Um, I've been told that they've watched the film at Skinwalker Ranch, uh, Travis Taylor and, um, um, Jay Stratton and, you know, some of these other folks have watched it and they're like, you know, this is sim very similar to what we've seen here on the ranch. Mm -hmm. You know, and those things haven't made the TV show. But um, I can tell you right now that, that as a video expert and as somebody that, like I just said, has been doing this their entire life, uh, my mission was to debunk uh, Barb Shoup's video. Not because I didn't want it to be real, sure. but because I didn't want to put it out there and have somebody else go, oh, yeah, you missed this, you fool. Yeah. Um, and so I spent four hours going through it and I'm looking at this angle, I'm looking at that angle and I'm, and you know, I have a pretty basic, decent understanding of visual effects and how visual effects work for, for big films and mm -hmm. rotoscoping and match moves and camera tracking. And, you know, I've done some of these things in the past. I did all the visual effects in the new film, for instance. And, you know, what I could tell instantly was there was no, there was no manipulation of the file. I got the original file right off of the device wow. from Barb herself, you know, which is rule number one. It wasn't passed down to me. Mm -hmm. I had a discussion with her about how it was taken, what happened. We filmed that whole process. Um, and, you know, at about hour number four, when I'm getting chills right now, when it hit me, that I can't debunk this. I knew that what I was looking at was the Patterson Gimlin of the paranormal Bigfoot. Yeah. hundred percent. And, um, and it was stunning. It's like, whoa, this is real and you're looking at it right now. Was, was this the video where she was out with a group of people in that littler thing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When I saw that the first time, I was absolutely floored. I was like, I had no doubt that what I had witnessed was the real thing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It, yeah. I think ultimately, and, and, and the fact that Barb saw something black, with her own eyes, she saw something black and it was cloaked for the camera. I mean, oh. it's unbelievable. And and the repercussions of that thought are huge. I mean that that means that there could be tons of Bigfoot, you know, images out there of them cloaked and they're just standing still, and you would never ever know. You yeah. would never know. But this particular 
uh, individual, this Bigfoot, I believe it was a juvenile, and I think Barb said the same thing, yeah. was sloppy. <laughs> <laughs> he got caught. Yeah. Or she got caught. Mm -hmm. But it's there and it's real. And um, I would love, I would invite anybody to come up with a reasonable explanation as to how this could possibly be anything other than Bigfoot, because I don't believe it can be done. I truly, truly believe that. Yeah, that was an incredible piece of footage. And I, you know, I, I don't know. I think I saw it pretty soon after she posted it. Like mm -hmm. it was very early in that. And I was like, why are more people talking about this? This is amazing. Um, yeah. but it never did. It never really got, I mean, within the community, I think it got a lot of traction, but, but there again, I think there were so many people that just wanted to, close that door, you know, because it didn't fit. That's the problem is in this, you know, the Bigfoot community is the paradigms and they are, they're the, they're, they are the walls within their, you know, personal uh, kingdom and the, and they won't go outside of it. They just won't do it. Even, even in the face of something like that, where it's like, well, something's going on here because mm -hmm. she caught that. Yeah. I was blown away by that. That's really cool. I'm glad to hear that, that, that you, that you did that and that you did a, uh, challenge it and, and we're unable to, you know, debunk it. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And I can say, I can say that you, you could go out and you could, you could redo it with visual effects, but you wouldn't get as good results. Mm -hmm. You would, it would look great. You know, it would fool a lot of people. Um, and it would be very, very expensive because you'd need, it's just like with the Patterson Gimlin footage. It's like the costume. You know, if yeah. it is a costume, you'd have to have Oscar winning costume designers working on it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. Um, in my opinion, I feel the same way about this is you, you, you'd really need some good Oscar winning visual effects artists to fake something like that. And I showed it to a guy who, who used to be a lead at ILM, Industrial Light and Magic. Uh -huh. Um, and he said the exact same thing. He's just like, I, you know, it was like you could fake it, but it would be too expensive. And I, I don't know what you have here. <laughs> um, but it looks, it looks real. Wow. That's really cool. That is really cool. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad to see that, that that is still being used as a point of reference in this because, yeah, again, it, it surfaced. It seemed big to me, but it just never really evolved or developed into anything other than a, than a footnote in the yeah. community. It's like, wow, that was huge. But, you know, I that's, was. That's ahead. why I brought it back because yeah. it didn't get it didn't get the, the kind of exposure it needed. And, and it. It just needed to have that extra. And when you see the film, you'll understand, you know, it needed to have a guy like Eric Barr take a look at it. It yeah. needed to be zoomed in on and enhanced. And we needed to hear Barb's story from her, you know, it yeah. just did, it didn't have those other elements to help kind of lift it up. Oh, that's so cool. I, and I'm, I'm glad that you talked with her as well. I mean, I don't know Barb at all, but I, I did follow her, her and Gabby's trips out and, you know, into the woods when they would check things yeah. out. It's like, wow, that's, you know, it's an incredible thing. Now, I want to ask you in the, you know, kind of a bigger quick, bigger picture question, but do you think there's more of this going on or do you think, it, well, it's kind of a catch-22, I guess it could be either, but in your opinion, is there more of these activities happening or is it just a matter of people being able to have the dialogue? You know, that's a great, great question. There's a lot of theories that um, are kind of kind of going out all over the place that, yes, the veil is becoming mm -hmm. thinner and thinner for some reason. Uh, some of those theories come back to the fact that, you know, with cell towers and 5G and all this other kind of, not to get to 5G conspiracy theories, but <laughs> there's a lot of, of electromagnetic energy that's, that's around. Mm -hmm. Wi-Fi, our phones in our pockets. And, um, you know, throughout, you know, the last 20, 30 years, there's been a ton, tremendous amount of Bigfoot sightings near power lines. Um, and, you know, we didn't put it in the film, but we measured the electromagnetic energy coming up power lines near the Al Moon lab. And it was peaking, man. It was, it was really high, you know, just, just that kind of like, electromagnetic energy in the air. And there's some theories that, that, you know, there's some power lines that run behind Skinwalker Ranch. There's some theories that Ryan Skinner has that that's helping to kind of boost the energy at Skinwalker Ranch. Mm -hmm. um, now, obviously, stuff at Skinwalker Ranch has gone back hundreds of years, but sure. but I feel like there's some sort of a, um, I don't know about fuel source or whatever, but I think that this, 
energy, this electricity in the air is really kind of helping to get these things out. Um, you know, and I, I think that, you know, there's, there's a lot of scientific proof to kind of back that up. Mm-hmm. Um, electromagnetic energy can also interfere with really sensitive people. Yeah. You know, um, you can get lightheaded and dizzy and, you know, maybe hallucinate. Um, and then that kind of, which, which kind of segues me into talking about Dr. Simeon Hine, who wrote the book Dark Matter Monsters, which I cannot recommend enough. Mm. Fabulous book. Um, Dr. Simeon Hine is in, um, a flash of beauty paranormal Bigfoot and he gets into the science behind what, or he gets into what could be the science behind all of these experiences. Oh, you know, why, how Bigfoot can cloak, mm-hmm. how they can turn into orbs, where the orbs come from, um, some of the anti-gravity. He gets into, um, you know, how the defense department is patenting some of these technologies. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, we realized, Jill, but, you know, Jill, myself, Mike, we were like, there is a science behind it. We just don't have the tools to measure it and or observe it yet. Um and so we need to find somebody who's interested in this. And I just kind of happened upon Dr. Dr. Hine and we sat him down at Washington State University and interviewed him. And I mean, like, like Jill and Mike and I were like walking around like zombies, like the whole rest of the day. We're like, that was the craziest, coolest thing ever. Oh, um, he's got some really solid theories on behind all of this stuff. Well, you know, I, and that's, that's kind of my take on the, the entire paranormal spectrum and I'm I'm glad to hear that there are there are academics and scientists who are who are looking into this with with you know serious inquiry because I don't think this is the stuff where reality kind of fell over on its side or glitched out I think whatever's being demonstrated here is incredibly profound and may may be the breadcrumbs to teach us of the nature of our reality I mean that's that it's not this rigid box, it's this fluid dynamic thing, you know, because I think traditional, you know, Newtonian sciences says, you know, this is the, this is the structure and we exist within it. But then it, you know, when you look at this unknowns and the weird stuff and an example I use all the time is like, you know, the paranormal could be your cereal bowl moves six inches by itself, which in, you know, in the scope of things, the universal scope of things is a, is a weird little quirky thing, but the ramifications of it are enormous. I mean, that cereal bowls aren't supposed to do that, and yet it happened. And so what does that mean? So I, I think it's incredibly profound that you guys not only are looking into the fact that people are experiencing weirdness, but you also pursued the the, the science and, and theory behind it, and that's a, that's amazing. Well played. Thank you. Thank you. It's important. It's important. And I believe that, you know, if the paranormal were a skyscraper, mm-hmm. then uh, Bigfoot would be the doorman. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So, in, you know, I went and saw, Jill and I went and saw that film um, After Death last night, this documentary. I highly recommend everybody check it out. It's basically about near-death experiences. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, you know, there was a couple of times we poked each other during the film going, wait a minute, wait a minute, we've heard this you know, in the Bigfoot round before, oh. you know, we're seeing these similarities between um, these different realities. Mm-hmm. And it kind of occurred to me, I came up with this horrible analogy that um, if, if our world were equated to something simple and I came up with an abacus. So let's say our reality is an abacus, mm-hmm. the actual reality and or realities of the universe is a supercomputer. So in other words, you're doing a calculation every two to three seconds, and the universe is calculating it trillions of times a second. Oh, you know what I mean? It's just like it's that so much more than we could possibly ever wrap our minds around. Right. But going back to what I was just saying, I, you know, Bigfoot really is kind of that door, doorman of the paranormal, and once you get beyond that realm and you start thinking about parallel universes and and how all of this might be actually around us at any given moment in time. Mm-hmm. Um, then you start getting into life after death oh. and, you know, of, you know, the other worlds and traveling to different planets through wormholes. And it just really kind of opens the whole box of what actually might be out there. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fascinating. Really incredibly profound. Um, 
what is what is the path forward from here for you guys? Uh, I know you were you were working with Ron Moorhead as well, and and working with his story, which I think is marvelous as well. I think Ron did some incredible things, and and certainly his Quantum Bigfoot s- stuff is is revolutionary. I think. Oh yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. We're gonna we're gonna kind of get our feet back, well, at least one foot back on the ground a little bit more with uh, with Ron Moorhead's documentary Voices in the Wilderness. Mm-hmm. We've already started filming it. Uh, we've interviewed um, Ron and his daughter Rhonda, who has some incredible things. This by no means are we going to askew the paranormal in this film mm-hmm. because uh, folks had some very interesting stuff happen to them up at Sierra Camp. And we were lucky enough to get um, two older gentlemen uh, last month in Merced, California, who were the original founders of the Sierra Camp. Oh, they, wow. Sierra Camp was actually handed over to them by some Basque sheep herders oh. that happened to be, like, herding sheep up there. Um, so we've interviewed them as well, and, and the stuff they had to say, I think, is is mind-blowing. People, people are going to be excited to hear that. So... We're working on that. That's going to take a little while to finish um, because we need to get back down to the Sierras. We want to go up to the camp, um, and there, you know, it's going to be snowed in now for the next probably six, seven months. So um, that's been a lot of a lot of fun so far. That's amazing. I I can't wait to see that as well. Um, Then uh, is there going to be another flash of beauty? You know, we're talking about it, Brent. it's a little premature to talk about what <laughs> we're thinking about doing, sure. but we've got some some great ideas. There are, there are no shortage of stories, mm-hmm. no shortage of stories, and you know every story that's in the paranormal Bigfoot it can be equated, you know, ten times, hundred times sure. by stories just as awe inspiring or crazy or bananas or whatever you want to call it. You know what I mean? There there are just so many amazing stories out there. Yeah, that's that's awesome, and I, I think it's it's great that you know again you guys are are bringing these things to light, and not only just to just to just to record them, but just the the passion and love that you guys have put into these projects, the uh, incredible you know attention to detail and and uh, really bringing them to life. So they're not just anecdotal; they're visual and they're and they're represented in such amazing amazing taste. You guys have done just marvelous. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. We just want to honor nature and the people that are courageous enough to come out and tell us their stories. And 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 what have you been at the point with, with people? I'm sure you must have gotten so many people reaching out to you saying, "Hey, you should hear about my story. You should hear my brother's story." And was it tough? It's got to be double tough to have to decide what's going to fit and what isn't. I mean, that's got to be a and a really arduous process, huh? It is. It is. And you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings because I don't, I don't think that there's one experience that's more important than the others. You know what I mean? It's, mm-hmm. they're, they're all just as important because we're observing something. We're observing something that could be the biggest story in, in human history, really. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, take your pick, Bigfoot aliens, you know, ghosts too. Um, but, you know, uh, you know, we, I, I like to tell people the aliens are our cousins, the Bigfoot are our brothers, you know. Um, oh, cool. To mankind, um, so yeah, it, it 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 wasn't easy, and sometimes we would, you know, like when we finished the first film, we would we would hear stories, and be like, oh man, it's too late to put that story in there, but we'd love to put that put that in there. Um, I mean, we could do this forever. Sure, you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> I don't think people would tire of it either, though. That's the that's the 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 cool part is that you know, again, you guys have done such a tremendous job that I think that as long as you keep putting them out there, you're going to have a ravenous community of. Uh, people wanting to check it out because you know you've done it so well thank you yeah thank you no no worries um can you please take a couple minutes and let people know where to find the films where to keep in touch with what you guys are doing yeah yeah so um we're we're shifting distributors right now um and so the first film a flashy beauty bigfoot revealed is available on tubi it's available on amazon it's available uh youtube riddles itunes um, it may not be available for a little bit here coming up in um, a few weeks, <clears throat> just FYI, but it will be back online. Uh, the Paranormal Bigfoot right now is not yet in wide release. It's only available on Vimeo. So if you go to vimeo.com 
forward slash on demand forward slash paranormal Bigfoot. You can rent it or you can purchase it from Vimeo. That will be expanding uh, hopefully sooner than later to Amazon and some of the other um, rental services, rental and purchasing services before it eventually transitions to a Vimeo and some of the ad supported services um, in the coming months. And that's fantastic. And, and Brett, thank you so much for making time for me today. I really appreciate it. It's, You're it's welcome. been a fascinating and incredible discussion and I, I hope you'll come back. And uh, Oh yeah, more. for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's, there's going to be a ton more stuff to talk about. Um, we've got these little stories that we're going to put that, you know, s- some stuff didn't make the cut for the original film just because of time and, and whatnot. So we're going to probably do these things called flashes of beauty that we'll be putting on our YouTube channel in the next coming, coming months. Oh, brilliant. Those and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thanks again, brother. It's been an absolute honor to talk with you and I really appreciate it. You're very welcome, man. Take it easy. All right, everybody, that's going to wrap it up for us today. So hope you guys enjoyed the show. And thank you again so much for all your love and support. Remember, if you want to follow the Paranormal Portal, probably the easiest way is to head over to ParanormalPortal.net. And that's the homepage for the Paranormal Portal. And you'll find links to all of our different social media and uh, sites and information about the shows, including our YouTube channel, which is YouTube.com slash Paranormal Portal. Or just look for Paranormal Portal on, on Google or whatever search search engine and you'll find links to our social media such as facebook instagram tiktok and uh twitter so we're kind of all over the place and we're spreading this as well as we can but anyway thank you so much for the love and support you all take care and remember we love you all be good be kind be nice take care of each other help each other out find the magic in every day and remember to laugh as much as you can until next time Well, the only time she really turned with that famous yep. was when I rode across the creek and got down off the horse. She turned to look at me.